Thanks very much. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you here today to the UW Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lecture. Uh, I realize you're not here to hear me, uh, but uh, let me begin by noting that if any of you get tired of standing, there is a video feed in room EE105, although I expect you all to uh, stay right where you are. Again, we're thrilled to welcome you here today, uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce University of Washington's new president, Michael Young, who will introduce today's speaker. President Young, thank you for being here. Uh, it's clear I need to teach Ed a, uh, an old academic trick, which is you want to cry to crowd. All you do is whisper very quietly, and the second question on the examination is, has an amazing effect in quieting uh, people down. But thank you for being with us. We are just uh, thrilled to have you here today. This is an exciting day uh, in the life of the university. Uh, and I have, I, I don't know if it's an unenviable task of introducing probably one of only two or three people in America about whom one can honestly say he needs no introduction, particularly to this crowd here. But I am honored to, uh, uh, to introduce our distinguished lecturer today, someone who, um, uh, who has very close ties to this university, uh, but for today's purposes is extraordinary in that there, there are very few people in the world who change the world once. And Bill Gates has changed it twice. Uh, not only with the creation of uh, one of the most extraordinary computer companies in the universe, Microsoft, uh, but with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, has changed our understanding of our relationship to the world and has enabled us in dramatic ways to start addressing a number of global challenges, including global health challenges. Uh, it's very few of us who have a chance to change the world twice. Uh, unprecedented to do it twice, I think. But we're very honored to have, uh, 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 to have uh, Bill with us today. Uh, they have been long, long time supporters of the university in so many different ways. I think it, it actually started uh, with uh, Bill's father, who is uh, sitting on the front row, one of our great regents. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, 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 Bill's father and mother probably have the distinction of being put together the longest serving regents in uh, university history. Uh, and we are so grateful for, uh, for your contributions to the university as well. Uh, but Bill and Melinda have also been extraordinary. Uh, Ed Lazowska, who you uh, heard from a minute ago, actually holds the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, professorship. Uh, as one of our uh, great computer scientists here, uh, we have benefited in other ways with this family, enabling us to keep a terrific professor like uh, Ed with us as well. So with that, uh, let me welcome to the stage uh, Bill Gates. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon. Ed, it's great to be here. Uh, you know, I used to spend time on this campus uh, stealing computer time. Uh, now, that's a very antiquated concept. Oh, thank you. Uh, because now, you know, we have personal computers. You know, there's sort of an infinite amount of computer time. Uh, but there was a time when, if you were addicted to using computers, it was a very tough addiction to deal with. And uh, this university was very attractive. It had uh, not many computers in the computer science department. They were kind of batch-oriented, B5500 uh, systems that were walled off you couldn't get into. But if you roamed around the campus enough, it turned out physics had a PDP-10. Down at the med centers, they had PDP-11s. And if you came at strange hours, you could essentially break in and use computer time. Uh, it didn't cause any damage uh, whatsoever. I never did... Uh, get a degree here or anywhere else. Uh, but uh, fortunately for me, uh, my addiction to computers became easier to satisfy uh, because of the invention of the microprocessor. And uh, my friend Paul Allen, who was very hardware-end, was the one who noticed uh, the very first chip coming out. And we talked about how Moore's Law, combined with that, would do really phenomenal things. Uh, led to, the, to you know, the software industry and all sorts of amazing things. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is that I think in terms of amazing things that come out of those breakthroughs, uh, we've only seen just the very beginning of it. 
and particularly when you think of domains outside of classic computer science, uh, things like health and education, the impact to date has been rather modest, uh, but in the decades ahead, I think it'll be rather dramatic. And I think that's an exciting opportunity uh, for all of you. Uh, I'm only going to talk for about a little more than 20 minutes or so, and the balance of our time uh, will be available for questions. So, you know, as I say things that are wrong or uh, stimulating, please uh, think up uh, questions to go with those. So when we talk about this miracle of availability, uh, one way to look at it is purely in a quantitative sense. Uh, that is that, uh, you know, almost any specific uh, number we can look at, it's quite unbelievable uh, how it's changed. The most dramatic of all is the, the cost of storage. And I, you know, an example of this, I remember somebody saying to me when we were in a meeting about education uh, about 12 years ago, well, we could record every class and we could just store up on a server and have everybody look at what the teachers were doing. And you know, because my mindset about how much storage cost was formed back uh, even before this uh, $700 per megabyte data point, you know, when they said that, I thought, no, no, you can't do that. And then I thought about, well, yeah, of course you can do that. Uh, and of course now, you know, it's so cheap that it's actually kind of absurd that we're not doing that, that we don't have that data set and we can't analyze, well, what's a good teacher do? What's a crummy teacher do? When do the good students start to get bored? When do the bad students start to get bored? Uh, you know, when, how well do people do at calming the classroom down? Well, we should just have this, this data set and start to understand who does it well, what's going on. Uh, you know, and, and that's, it, it, that's driven by a quantitative uh, advance, but it's a, a qualitative change. Uh, cost of RAM, similar, not quite as dramatic, uh, different level of the, the uh, storage hierarchy. Hierarchy, and then we have processor speed, and this one, of course, is very dramatic uh, over the, uh, the the last 15 years. What's interesting on this one is if you look at it on a per thread type basis, uh, we actually probably won't see, uh, short of some surprise breakthrough, we won't see much change here. If we if we let ourselves have you know many threads per processor, many processors, then we'll get something. But the nature of the improvement is no longer sort of a brute force, just write your program the way you used to and you, you get that benefit. So the numbers are very dramatic, you know, a factor of a million in the, uh, the smallest case. And so it means you really need young people whose imagination about what all this power can do uh, hasn't been distorted by the scarcity of resource uh, that uh, sort of gets embedded and anyone who's been around thinking about these problems for enough time. And so what this leads to is some areas that I think will be at the center of computer science uh, in the next 20 years. You know, natural user interface, um, you know, vision, speech, ink, you know, sensors everywhere. I got a, a chance to see today some really uh, phenomenal digital sensor stuff going on here. And not super expensive stuff, I mean stuff that's so cheap you know, it almost just comes for free, and yet it can do amazing things. Uh, cloud computing, uh, you know, we've got uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, so many uh, people going after that. And it's really just at the beginning, sort of that infinite server that eventually you'll have quality guarantees that are associated with that. And all you'll be fighting is the um, latency problems about where the local input and processing uh, should do the work versus uh, going out, out into the cloud. I'll be talking a lot today about modeling of different types. It's a very broad term, but it you know, basically means being able to determine what would happen in the real world by uh, creating the, uh, the computer-based model. And a lot of the activities I'm involved with now really have modeling at the center. Uh, I'm going to talk particularly about disease modeling because that's so important to drive the strategies of the, the foundation work I do.